I'm going to uh, piggyback off of Mark's comments of what we sang, another song uh, that we sang, and I want to raise the question, well, what should that do to us? It's not just truth that we receive, but what should it do to us? So another song that we sang, and we said this, This I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid my ransom. What's a ransom? In kidnapping, somebody is kidnapped, and they say, okay, you'll get your person back if you give us a ransom. If you pay so much money, you'll get your person back, or whatever. That's a ransom, right? That you, uh, he have paid my ransom? What ransom? I haven't been kidnapped. Well, the ransom is that sin has caused now for me to belong to Satan. And you know what the ransom is? To get me back? To rescue me from Satan? Mm, Let's say five trillion dollars. Not million. Not billion. Five trillion dollars. Can anybody pay that? Anybody pay that? No. That's what Jesus paid for you and for me. This I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Now do you see why we worship him? And that's why now from that, well, what should that, how should that affect us? How should that penetrate and change our lives? Because it's not just good information. Ooh, I feel inspired. To do what? (laughs) It should inspire us to change It should inspire us to say, how can I change so that I represent my Savior? And change is going to take pain and sacrifice. Because most of us think, no, I'm pretty good. You know, I've arrived. We don't say that, but, you know, I'm good enough. No, no, the fact is that's not it. Uh... As I try to change, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be conflict within myself. There's going to be conflict with my relationships. There's going to be all kinds of conflicts. But if I say, man, he paid the ransom for me. How can I honor him with my life? And that means that there's going to be change. Now, where do we begin? Where do we begin? Well, we begin with... Honesty. Honesty. What is the reality of our being, of our relationships? And uh, that's going to take a long, long time to go there, right? So I'm just going to focus on one, uh, and that is our relationships. Uh, There's a strong temptation to present the Christian life as conflict-free. Whether it's within the family, within the church, what have you. That's just simply not true. Uh, Because when people, I remember we were meeting and uh, this one man says, you know, my wife and I have been married for 30 years and we've never fought. (laughs) Fake and phony. (laughs) I mean, that's the reality. Come on. You know, my wife and I have knocked down drag outs. I'm the pastor, man. (laughs) I'm telling you, that's the way it is. Uh, You know, we need to come honest with before God if there's going to be change. And if I'm going to, why am I do I want to change? Because, man, I want to honor the one who paid the ransom for me. An eternal ransom for me. You see? And so, <laughs> that's just the way it is. And when, when we are fake and phony, listen, the, church, the, the world sees that. The world just, oh my goodness, they want, want to choke. Come on, man, be for real. Uh, 
And when it comes to the church, there's conflict. So, you know, <laughs> some of you might remember we were in some conflict years ago. And there's a passage that I was reading afterwards. And it's like, what? Really? No. That, surely that's not it. I mean, because that's not right. But it's there in the text. There's there in the Bible. And so we all need to go back to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say? Because I can have all kinds of ideas, right? I can have all kinds of ideas of the Christian life. But we all need to go back to the Word of God. And so if you want to turn with me by way of uh, introduction, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, this is just an introduction because we're eventually going to end up in Acts chapter 15, verses 30 to 41. But right here, I just want you to note, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17. Chapter 11, verse 17. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. And by the way, I'm reading from the New King James. My Bible is being restored. It's all tore up, so it's being restored. Uh, Since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. Not good. And I thought, yep, no, the church is supposed to be harmonious. No, no problem, shouldn't be a problem. And then I read the next verse, verse 19. For there must also be factions among you. What? There have to be divisions? No. That must, that Greek must, something, that, that translation is not good. So I went to the Greek. Oh my goodness. That word must is day in the Greek. And that word day signifies, listen to this, signifies this is God's design. This is God's will. What? Is God's will that there'd be divisions in the church? Whoa. Man, even the Greek says this. I have no way to escape from that. That's what the Word of God says. And then, what's the next part of the verse? That those who are approved may be recognized among you. It's like, wow, wow. There should be divisions in the church, splits. It's like, wow. I had to reconsider that, right? But, but you see, God is honest, is real, so that we can look and see. And, and, and you know, okay, let me work with that reality. And when we come to Acts 15, whew, there was a big problem, several big problems, you see? So, before we go on, I want to raise the question, how do you deal with conflict? Sweep it under the rug? Uh, people can't know that we fight. Uh, so let's pretend everything's okay. Just smile all the time, no problem. Our effectiveness is not going to be there, you see? Because the reality, we all know there's conflict. We all know that. So, you know, how do you want to be strong? Do you want to be a good representative of truth? Because if you just want to be a representative of somebody that's always happy, 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 and no problem, no problem all the time, okay, try it. See if that works. No, no. When we come to the book of Acts, Acts 15, there's major problemas. I mean, <laughs> big problems within the church. Within the church. And there's ways to deal with the conflicts. You see? And whether it's within the family, within ourselves, within our friendships, within the church, there's ways to deal with it. But conflicts there will be. So, in chapter 15, starting in verse 30, let me read the passage, by the way. Uh, Acts 15, verse 30 and following. So... When they, that is the ones that were sent to Antioch from Jerusalem, they were sent to Antioch. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. 
when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now, Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. Uh, actually, verse 34 doesn't have good uh, representation, so it's probably not in the original. But they, you know, however, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. And I know why they did it. They, somebody, some scribes said, we need to add that. I'll tell you why later. But verse 35, Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take him uh, with them. The one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had gone, uh, not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by, uh, commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. We find Paul and Barnabas getting into such division, such tension between them, they separated. And these two guys were awesome together. That's the reality. It's right there in the text, right? So, here's what I say. Church conflicts will arise. It's a certainty. Church conflicts will arise. So, strong believers are required to strengthen the church. Those that are left behind, there's not to be those that are qualified to strengthen the church. We find this in the text. I'm not making it up for myself or for anybody else. It's there in the text. You see it. And you're going to see more of it as we go through the details. Now, all of chapter 15 uh, is a transition, right? Big, major transitions are happening in the church. What's the transition? Well, the transition is from Judaism to Christianity. Right? The whole Old Testament into the New Testament. And can you imagine the tension? Because Christianity came out of Judaism. But what? Do we practice all the Old Testament laws and all of this? And so there was a big, big conflict and tension. You see? Uh, just look at chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Chapter 15, right there in the book of Acts. Look at it. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Oops. Paul had been preaching otherwise. And Barnabas. You see, so major conflicts. So it's like, ah, ah, conflict, conflict. So you know what? Let's get a group together. Let's send them up to the White House. Let's send them up to Jerusalem and find out what the apostles and the elders say. So that's what they did. You see, that's what they did. So that was this uh, major conflict and the, 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 the transition from Old Testament to New Testament teachings. And then there was a, also a transition happening from Jerusalem being the, 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 the mother church over to Antioch, now separating Judaism more and more from Christianity. And so any times that we've said, any time there's transitions in life, there's going to be tensions. Just as uh, we mentioned the last time, when there's a transition from being a toddler to being an uh, adolescent, from adolescence to a you know, teenager, and then on to marriage, and then to middle age, and then on to older. And if you don't make those transitions good, it's not going to be good for life, right? We, there, but there's going to be tension all the time. And that's what we have here. There's growth, there's change, and there's conflict. And how do we deal with this? How do we deal in life with conflicts? Well, we go back to the basics. What is absolutely, absolutely critical that we must hold on to? And what are some things that, well, you know, this would be good, this would not be good. So, you know, we can have differences and it's okay. It's okay, you see, to have differences. So here we have this in, in uh, Acts chapter 15, these major, major conflicts 
and so, first of all, in chapter 15, the verse 11 verses, is like, what's critical? What's critical? The gospel. Is Jesus Christ, faith alone, Christ alone. There's no other way for salvation. Those are the first 11 verses. And then from verse uh, 12 on to all the way to 29, it's like, okay, we've got salvation, but, but we need to be culturally sensitive. You see? The Jews had been, you know, taught a certain way of Moses, and so the Gentiles were being told, look, stay away from these things that are offensive to the Jews. Be culturally sensitive. In fact, the last verse, verse 29 of Acts 15, it says, that you abstain, here, here, well, verse 28, for it seems good to the, uh, to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, uh, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these things, you will do well. This is not a matter of salvation. This is a matter about living the good Christian life and sensitive culturally to the Jews. You see? So let's be effective. And so you go to the most critical things, what's really, really necessary in the Christian life, and there's some other things we can be flexible. Right? Uh, there's a lot to say there because obviously sexual immorality is not flexibility. But be culturally sensitive. And that's the point. But now we're going to go on and say, well, how are we effective in the Christian life? How can we be effective? And we're going to have differences of opinion. But that's okay. There can even be some, some, some separation, you know. But what's critical? What's critical? And then what's not? All right. That can still cause divisions. So here we go. Uh, the apostles that had already sent the letter, right? And, and, and now we begin in verse 30. What happened? That the, uh, those that were sent arrived in Antioch. They were sent from Jerusalem. And they arrived in Antioch. They said, hey guys, come on, let's get together. Because here's the letter from, you know, from the authorities, from the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. And so they gathered everybody and delivered the letter. And what happened in verse 31? Um, when they read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. They were greatly encouraged. Um, the Jerusalem uh, church had sent strong men. Strong men. In fact, look at verse 22 of Acts 15. Then it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own country to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named uh, Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. Why were these men leading men? Because they were good at business? Because they were good at, at you know, just being jokers and uh, attracting a, a crowd? Why were these men leading men? Look at verse 26. Men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why, besides Paul and Barnabas, these men had risked their lives in representing Jesus Christ. You see, those are the men that were sent with Barnabas and, and, and Paul from Jerusalem down to Antioch. And so, when, you know, they came to Antioch, it's like, okay, here are solid representatives. And they gathered the people, they delivered the letter, and when the people uh, read the letter, it's like, wow, what encouragement. Why would they be encouraged? Because there was division, right? You're supposed to keep the Old Testament to be saved. No, you don't have to. It's Jesus Christ. No, you're supposed to be circumcised. No, it's only Jesus Christ. Big division. When the letter came, it's like, okay, we have clarity. Thank you. You see, they rejoiced over the comfort of having split their uh, dissension, and it was clarified. Now, I want you to know something. Was that the end of it? No. No. Look at what happens next. It's like, oh my goodness. Verse 32. Now Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. <laughs> you know the many words there? You know, what it, you know what it actually means? They had long sermons. 
I love it. He says what he says there. Man, they were long-winded. But they kept preaching and preaching the word. Why? Because it's not a matter of just being in harmony and, 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 and you know, the, the basic things of Christianity. No, there's more. And that was somebody told me, man, Reuben, uh, next Sunday, what are you going to preach? You already said everything that needs to be said. <laughs> One sermon is like, what? <laughs> there's always, you get into the word of God, man, there's so much richness. I don't have enough time. But that's what they said. They're, they're, they're long sermons. I'm not kidding. It's there. Look. So don't complain about 45-minute sermons. <laughs> I mean, this guy just went on. Just... But they were exhorting and strengthening. Note that carefully. Strengthening the breath. How? With the Word of God. That's how they were strengthening the brethren. And so... They stayed a long time, and they were prophets, and there it is. And so, what do we find at, you know, th th there's harmony had been achieved. Harmony had been achieved for verse 33, and after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. Now there was a, a harmony between Antioch and Jerusalem, the White House, so to speak, spiritually. And man, there's awesome, and there's harmony. You see, there's strength, but it doesn't stop there. Well, verse 34, it seemed good to Silas and to remain there. And why did somebody say, look, uh, in the next verse, or Paul uh, decided to take Silas in verse 40. So if he, Paul took, in verse 40, took Silas, you know, we need to stick in there that Silas decided to remain. Okay, whatever. Verse 35, Paul and Barnabas also remain in Antioch. And what did they do? Look at it, it's right there. Teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. In other words, in other words, just like Silas and Judas were preaching more and more the word of God, Paul and Barnabas even added more words to that. You know, uh, again, we, we need to taste the word of God. We need to see how it, it addresses every area of my life. Every area of my life. And it is the word of God, meaning, meaning God knows exactly where our soul is. God knows exactly where our mind is. God knows exactly what we need. We think we know what we need. And so, no, that's why we need to go back to the word, back to the word. Because that's the light of God. The light of of God, which we need. Why do we need light? Because sin has darkened our emotions. Sin has darkened our thinking. Sin has darkened our decision making. Sin has weakened us, corrupted us. And the word of God is able to restore, restore our emotions, restore our thinking, this, restore our, our volition, our, our, our decision making. God is able to restore our whole being. But it's through the word of God. Both uh, Silas and Judas, Paul and Barnabas, man, even though there had been harmony, right, on the fundamental teachings of how do we get saved through Jesus Christ alone, faith alone. But now Paul, okay, so they strengthened the, the believers in Antioch, even though they're already believers, right? Uh, <clears throat> Paul says, uh, looked around, he's like, well, they've gotten a lot. You know what? How about going to the churches where we were before that we established? They're baby churches, right? Antioch, man, they had already a lot of, a lot of uh, strong men, you know, and they still needed the word of God. What about those new churches where we went? Hey, hey, Barnabas, why don't we go back and let's see how they're doing, man. Let's strengthen them. Oh, good idea. So, you know, uh, Verse 36, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. They're new churches. And what, do they want to do? what does Paul want to do? Preach the word. You know, and again, it's not, a, um, it's not like, oh, 
the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, oh, nothing else, just the Bible. No, it's because the Bible is the revelation of God to what we actually need to know God better, to know ourselves better, to know about relationships, to know about all of life, what really matters. You see, that's why we need the Word of God, and that's why the Apostle Paul, let's go back to preach the Word. Uh, where they had preached already. See how they're doing. Now, here comes the conflict. And uh, initially, it wasn't that Barnabas was saying, we got to take John Mark. Not uh, already determined this is the way it's going to be. No, it wasn't like that. The tense there is what's called the imperfect tense. And many times that imperfect tense in the Greek is like, this is something that was mm, a, 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 a repetition uh, an ongoing desire that he had. And he, if it was an ongoing desire, the likelihood is that he was expressing, I, I think we'll take John Mark. I think we'll take, I'd like to take John Mark. I, you know, let's take John Mark. Let, John Mark. And Paul said, well, let me weigh that. Verse 13, Barnabas was determined, really, that I, I don't think that that's the right translation. He initially was more that he was desiring this uh, to take with them John called Mark. I'll say more about this, John Mark. Uh, but Paul insisted, and there again, the, it's also the same uh, imperfect tense. Like Paul was, mm, I don't think so. I don't think it'd be good because it says there. But Paul insisted, and it really, uh, the Greek there, he valued, he counted. He said, uh, as I weigh things, mm, I don't think it'd be a good idea. But then Paul had to repeat it because Barnabas was repeating it as well. We need to take John Mark. We need to take John Mark. And Paul was like, mm, I don't think so. Nah, mm, nah. As I weigh things. And what was he weighing? What was the Apostle Paul considering? Look at what it says right there in the text. Uh, the one who had departed from Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. If you go back to chapter 12, 13, 14, what had happened was the Apostle Paul went on a missionary journey, the first missionary journey. And it was hard. It was hard. And John Mark got to the point of saying, Ooh, uh, no, I want to go home with mommy. And so he left. And, you know, like, wait a minute. We're going to the missionary journey and you're abandoning us? And, you know, after that, when Paul and Barnabas went to all the other uh, cities, if you want to go back to those sermons, it was tough, man. I mean, they were rejected. They were thrown out of the country. At one point, the Apostle Paul was stoned and left for dead. I mean, we're talking about violent opposition. And that's where John Mark is, no, I'm not going there. I'm out of here. And that's what the Apostle Paul was thinking. It's like, man, there was some rough opposition. And you want to take John Mark? Remember, he bailed out. And, and, and the Apostle Paul was saying, that's what I'm thinking, that we need to go back to those churches where there was a violent opposition. I don't think it'd be a good idea to take John Mark. You know, he weighed and he weighed and he made a wise decision. Not necessarily that he was rejecting John Mark, and I'll say more about that in a minute. It's not that he was rejecting John Mark or that he was rejecting Barnabas at all. He would just say, man, what is wisest here? You see? And so uh, the Apostle Paul says, no, I, I, I don't think so, man. In Acts 13, verse 13, you're going to be turning there. Acts 13 and verse 13, this is where John Mark, it says, Now when Paul and his party set sail from uh, Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, John Mark, John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. He said, I, I, I want to be safe, guys. And so he went back to the White House, so to speak. Jerusalem. And so that's what the Apostle Paul was saying. Wait a minute, guys. When it got tough, this guy bailed. And, and we're going right back to those places where I was stoned to death. I, we need to have some strong people to go. Because we're going into the ministry that requires that. You see? And so that's what the Apostle Paul was weighing. Barnabas uh, made a decision. Uh, then the contention became so sharp... That they departed from one another. It caused a split. And let me tell you, Paul and Barnabas, they were buddies, man. They worked together. 
against enemies. In fact, in fact, right there in chapter 15, remember chapter 15, verse 1? What was happening? There was a great division, right? Hey, you need to keep the Old Testament law. You need to be circumcised according to Moses' customs in order to be saved. And look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension to dispute with them, Paul and Barnabas were together fighting against doctrinal enemies, against those that were teaching error. Paul and Barnabas were together. It's no small dissension. I mean, they were, I mean, and I, you know, Jews can be pretty loud. Mexicans too. We, we can be pretty loud. But man, they're like at each other's face, like, rawr, rawr, rawr. Paul and Barnabas were working together against the enemies, doctrinal enemies, error. And yet, at the end of the chapter, same chapter 15, verse 39, then the uh, con contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. Wow. Wow. This was within the church. This was within the leadership. You see that? There it is. And now, we have a description. So Barnabas took uh, Mark and sailed to Cyprus. A couple of things. One, John Mark was cousin with Barnabas. And Cyprus was Barnabas' home country, home place. So I'm going to take my relative and I'm going to go be in my home. Okay. Play it safe. Está bien. That's okay. That's okay. Go. And I want you to note, I mean, this is just the reality. You look at the rest of Acts. Right here is the last time Barnabas is mentioned in the book of Acts. The last time. Wow. Wow. Does that disqualify Barnabas? No. That does not disqualify Barnabas. In fact, I'm going to show you some scriptures where Paul and Barnabas continue to actually be friends. You know? But this is here, in terms of ministry, in terms of the book of Acts, last time Barnabas is mentioned. He took John Mark, his cousin, and went to his hometown, home place. Okay. What did Paul do? But Paul cho chose who? Who? Silas. Who is Silas? Who? Is Silas? Chapter 15 and uh, verse 22, the end of the verse, Silas leading men among the brethren. Verse um, 26, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that was Silas. Paul says, man, we're going to uh, a place where pretty dangerous, violent opposition. I was stoned to death. I was left for dead. I wasn't dead, but I was left. That's how bad it was. So who am I going to take? I need to take men that are willing to risk their lives for Jesus Christ. And that's who he chose. Verse 40. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. Here's another point. Barnabas did not wait for the commend commandment from the church, right? Paul waited until, hey, man, the brethren said, you know, brother, let's lay hands on you. Let's send you to the grace of God. Barnabas didn't wait for that. He didn't wait for that. He just did it. Paul says, hey, man, commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And what did they do? What did they do? See, you go back to what's fundamental, what is fundamental? Because you need to stick with the fundamental. We can disagree with a whole bunch of things. But what is critical? Verse 41. And he went through Syria and Cilicia. What? Strengthening the churches. Point. Question. How was the church being strengthened? Right there in verse 32. What does it say? Now Judas and Silas themselves being prophet also exhorted and strengthened the same Greek word in verse 32 as verse 41. Same Greek word. How were they strengthening the church? By the word of God. By long sermons. 
<laughs> That's what it says. And then in verse 35, Paul and Barnabas also remain in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of God with many more long sermons. <laughs> So when it says in verse 41 that Paul was strengthening the church, guess what he was doing? Long sermons. <laughs> he was preaching the word. That is so basic in the church. That's why we want to emphasize we have Sunday school. We have the word of God. I, I, I am committed to studying so that I can, this is not my message. You know, uh, sometimes I, you know, people say, oh, that was a great message. No, it's the Word of God. I mean, it's, I, I just kind of add just kind of verbiage, but it's the Word of God. It's not my message. It's right there. You see that? What's basic, what's fundamental is having the Word of God explained and understood and applied. So, here are the applications. Application number one. Now, verse 30 and 33 show that we should be seeking harmony, right? That the, 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 the apostles and the uh, elders from Jerusalem sent a letter to harmonize, to, to come together on the basics, and, and the people in Antioch rejoiced over the encouragement, right? And then after the, the church in Antioch were encouraged and strengthened, they sent the, the brethren back to Antioch. Man, greetings, brother, so, so to speak, thank you. Right? We are together in this. Yes. And we do always to be seeking uh, harmony as much as possible. You see? As much as possible. Seek harmony. You know, just because we're different with somebody else, don't, don't condemn other people. No. The Lord may be using them in other ways. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. But we do need to be seeking harmony as much as possible. And by the way, that's uh, <clears throat> at all levels. Right? Within friendships, within the family, within the church, seek harmony. But sometimes it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So, uh, <clears throat> what are we to do? Application number two expect splits, expect separations. Don't be shocked by it. Don't be like, oh my goodness, the world's going to come to an end. No, it's okay. God hasn't lost his sovereignty. God knows exactly what's needed and what's going to happen. And God's going to use that person over there and that person over there, this person here, and the Lord is in charge. It's okay. But expect, you know, splits. Um, and we see differing ministries. And so, you know, people may be qualified in different ways in other ministries. That's okay. Um, God uses different ways and in different areas of the Christian ministry. So, uh, I want you to note, the Apostle Paul wasn't rejecting John Mark. He wasn't rejecting Barnabas. In fact, turn to Colossians. Colossians uh, chapter 4. Uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 4. Uh, and this is towards the end of his ministry. The Apostle Paul, uh, he's already in, uh, in Rome and he's in jail and he's about to die. And look, look what it says here. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. As he's giving his last greetings, the Apostle Paul, he says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. There it is. You see that? John, Mark, and Barnabas are cousins. About whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. How about that? Welcome John, Mark, Cousin of Barnabas. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of, are of the circumcision, and those are Jews. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Um, Epiphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he was a great zeal for you, those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea uh, and Nymphus and ch the church that is in, in, the, in her house. 
So you see there's a, a, a relationship between Barnabas and, um, and John Mark. Now turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, which is just a little bit more. Again, these are very important because it shows Paul, his attitude towards John Mark. He wasn't qualified to go to the dangerous playa, but look here. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. Again, this is what Paul towards the end of his ministry uh, in Rome. Uh, it says, verse 9, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved his present world, and has departed from Thessalonica, uh, Sessons for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only look it with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in ministry. The Apostle Paul is saying, bring John Mark. He is useful for ministry. This type of ministry. Not the one that I was going to, to those dangerous places. You see that? So we can expect splits, separation, but that doesn't mean that we condemn those people that we differ with. God is going to use them in different ways, but expect it. We're not going to be in harmony all the time. Um, so, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 through 6, Paul respects Barnabas. Just to, you can write that down, go back and see. Now, the, my last application is, is obvious from what we've saw, saw already. We need the Word of God. We need the Word of God, right? Verse 32, verse 35, verse 31. It's amazing. Uh, it never ends, brothers and sisters. I want you to turn to my last passage, uh, Colossians. Go back to Colossians chapter 1. And I remember reading this for the first time. It's like, what? I mean, <laughs> but now I understand more. You see, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 and following, the Apostle Paul builds the, builds the Colossians. He's like, oh my goodness, you're awesome, guys. You're love. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Verse 3, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. I mean, can you imagine more uh, mature people than that? Their faith in Christ and their love for the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Which has come to you as he is also in all the world and brings forth fruit. It is also among you. I mean, you're bearing fruit. Uh, since the day you heard and knew of the grace of God in truth. I mean, wow, what mature Christians, right? And he keeps on, verse 7. As you also learned from Epiphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. is like, man, these guys, they know nothing else. They have faith, they have blood, they have fruits, everything, right? Verse 9, <laughs> for this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding and that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of Christ. Wow! Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. No matter how mature, the Apostle Paul was saying that you may increase in knowledge. Wow! You see, it's never, never enough, so to speak. We always need to be refreshed and hear the Word of God. And hear the Word of God because the moment we think we've arrived, nah. Sorry, there's pride that's there. Or blindness, arrogance, if we think that we have arrived. I praise God that he reminds me over and over and over, Reuben, you are a baby in many ways in the spiritual life. It's like, okay then. <laughs> it's like, okay then, Lord. That's true. I need the word of God myself all the time. All the time. And I need to hear the worship. I need to see you fellow believers grow and that encourages me i'm sitting there and i'm listening and i just i start weeping over the truth that we're singing the worship team helps me i need 
the worship team. I need you. I need the strength from fellow believers. You see, we're all to be working together, but we need the word of God. Don't stop learning. Keep hearing and learning and studying the word of God, will you? Amen. You need to make a decision whether you will or not. Because I can yell and scream and I can do all kinds of things, but it's your decision. Your decision. And maybe it's a time that you get out a calendar. Or you know what? Every morning, every evening, whenever you want to, I'm committing to reading the Word of God. And not just to, okay, I read it, check, next thing. No, no. Lord, help me as I read. Lord, help me understand. You see? But I'm going to commit to reading, to learning, to whatever. I need to get the Word of God, will you? We all need the Word of God. So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Let my love look like you and what you mean.